Welcome to Chapter 3, Infancy and Toddlerhood. In this chapter, we're going to be looking at physical growth and development. Specifically, we'll be looking at things like reflexes, sleep, and nutrition. We'll also look at cognitive development. We'll look at Piaget's theory, memory, and language. And then finally, we'll be taking a look at psychosocial development. Specifically, we'll be looking at temperament, attachment, and self-awareness. By the time you finish this chapter, you should be able to summarize overall physical growth during infancy. You should also be able to describe the growth of the brain during infancy and explain infant sleep. You should also be able to identify newborn reflexes and describe them. You should also be able to compare gross and fine motor skills and contrast the development of the senses in newborns. You should be able to describe the habituation procedure and explain the merits of breastfeeding and when to introduce more solid foods. You should also be able to discuss the nutritional concerns of Merasmus and Kwashiakor. Growth is more rapid in infancy than during any other period after birth. Typically, infants double their birth weight by four months of age and triple their birth weight by the first year. The rate of growth is so rapid, if it continued throughout childhood, a typical 10-year-old boy would be nearly as long as a jumbo jet and weigh almost as much. Right after birth, babies lose 5% of their weight. In addition, we start to see a change in proportions. At birth, the head is 25% of our length, whereas by adulthood, it's 20% of our length. So infants are not simply scaled down versions of adults. Compared with adolescents and adults, infants and young children look top heavy because their heads and trunks are disproportionately large. As growth of the hips, legs, and feet catches up later in childhood, their bodies take on more adult proportions. Here in figure 3-1, you can see an image that shows you the changes in proportions that people experience throughout their lives from infancy on into adulthood. The physical changes that we see as infants grow are very impressive. Even more awe-inspiring are changes involving the brain and the nervous system. Infants' feelings of hunger or pain, their smiles or laughs, and their efforts to sit upright or to hold a rattle all reflect the functioning of the brain and the rest of the emerging nervous system. So how does the brain accomplish these many tasks? To answer this question, we need to look at the organization of the brain. The basic unit in the brain and the rest of the nervous system is the neuron, a cell specialized for receiving and transmitting information. Neurons have basic elements that we're going to look at now. First, the cell body. The cell body is in the center of the cell and it contains the biological machinery that keeps the neuron alive. The receiving end of the neuron is the dendrite, and it receives inputs from thousands of other neurons. The tube-like structure that emerges from the other side of the cell body is the axon. The axon transmits information to other neurons. At the end of the axon are small knobs that are called terminal buttons. And these terminal buttons release chemicals that are known as neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are messengers that carry information to nearby neurons. Neurons never touch. Instead, they communicate via these neurotransmitters. Another important term for you to know is the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath surrounds the axon, and the myelin sheath serves the important function of insulating the axon. It also is important in helping to speed up the neural impulse. Here's figure 3-2, where you'll see the components of the neuron. The first thing you'll see on the left-hand side is the cell body, and then you'll see the dendrites. And remember, the dendrites receive messages from other cells. And then we have the axon. The axon is what gives the neuron its length, and it's covered by the myelin sheath. The myelin sheath helps to speed up the impulse, and it insulates the axon. You'll also notice the terminal buttons, and the terminal buttons release neurotransmitters. And remember, neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that facilitate the transmission of information from one neuron to the next. And also remember that neurons never touch. Because of that communication, they don't need to. They rely on neurotransmitters. 
Let's take a look at some of the changes that happen in neurons in infancy. The first thing that we see happening is synaptogenesis. And synaptogenesis is the formation of synapses between neurons in the nervous system. And even though this occurs throughout a healthy person's lifespan, there's an explosion of synapse formation that occurs in early brain development. Another important term is synaptic blooming, and this is a period of rapid neural growth. And this is followed by synaptic pruning. So after the period of rapid growth in synapses, the brain starts to remove synapses that it no longer needs. So once the brain forms a synapse, it can either be strengthened or weakened. And this depends on how often the synapse is used. In other words, this process follows the use it or lose it principle. Synapses that are more active are strengthened and synapses that are less active are weakened and ultimately pruned. The process of removing these irrelevant synapses during this time is what is referred to as synaptic pruning. Babies are born with relatively few myelinated axons. That's one reason that infants can't see well and can't do much with their hands other than grasping and batting at objects. As children get older, different areas of the brain become myelinated on a genetically determined timetable. And these periods of myelination are critical periods for learning. About 50 billion to 100 billion neurons make up an adult's brain. The wrinkled surface of the brain is the cerebral cortex, and it's made up of 10 billion neurons. The cortex regulates many functions that we consider human. It consists of left and right halves that are called hemispheres, which are linked by a thick bundle of neurons that are called the corpus callosum. The characters you value the most, for example, your personality, your way with words, or your knack for reading others' emotions, are all controlled by specific regions of the cortex. For example, your personality and your ability to make and carry out plans are largely centered in an area of the front of the cortex called the frontal lobe. And so this part of the brain is important in thinking, planning, memory, and judgment. Each of these hemispheres is divided into four lobes. So in addition to the frontal lobe, we have the parietal lobe, which is important in processing information about touch, the occipital lobe, which is important in processing visual information, and then the temporal lobe, which is important in processing auditory information and language. When thinking about the frontal lobe and specifically the prefrontal cortex, its development is uniquely important during infancy, and it has important implications for how children's early environments shape the development of frontal circuits important for complex cognitive skills. Animal models and human studies suggest that the development of the frontal lobe structure, function, and behaviors are permanently shaped by and may be uniquely susceptible to early adverse experiences. So fortunately, there's growing awareness across the scientific community, government organizations, private organizations, and corporations, and the general public that children are not just resilient, the adverse early experiences can lead to a myriad of harmful outcomes at both the individual and societal level. One thing we'll be looking at later in the semester is what is known as adverse childhood experiences. And this particular, it was a study that was done and it was instrumental in demonstrating the importance of early experiences for health related outcomes in adulthood. During infancy, we see lateralization, and this is where different functions of the brain become localized primarily on one side of the brain or the other. We also see neuroplasticity. This is the brain's ability to change both physically and chemically in response to environmental stimulation, hormonal processes, and medications. Neuroplasticity enhances the brain's adaptability to environmental change and helps the infant to compensate for injury. The younger that a person is, the greater the level of neuroplasticity. While adults exhibit neuroplasticity, it's not to the degree that we see in early childhood and infancy. The sleep needs for babies vary depending on their age. Newborns do sleep much of the time, but their sleep is in very short segments. 
As the baby grows, the total amount of sleep slowly decreases, but the length of nighttime sleep increases. So generally, newborns sleep about eight to nine hours in the daytime and about eight hours at night. And there is, of course, some variation. But they might not sleep more than an hour or two at a time. Most babies don't start sleeping through the night, meaning about six to eight hours, without waking until they're about three months old or until they weigh about 12 to 13 pounds. And about two thirds of babies are able to sleep through the night on a regular basis by about six months. You also notice here some important terms. One is polyphasic, and this means that there are several sleep periods throughout the day. You'll also notice here that infants or newborns spend about 50% of their sleep time in REM. So when parents watch their baby sleep, they might be wondering, is their baby dreaming? Well, while we, while we may not know what they're dreaming about, the answer is of course, yes. In fact, their baby is dreaming a lot more in the first few months of life than they ever will at any other time. So REM stands for rapid eye movement. And it's called this because their eyes move quickly in different directions during the sleep phase. And this is due to activity in the brain, which is how dreams happen. So dreams can also happen in other phases of sleep, but they're most vivid in REM. The time spent in sleep and in REM decreases with age. REM is very important for everyone to get, but it's especially important for babies. It might not sound very restful, but it's incredibly important. Some of the benefits include learning and memory. So studies have shown that humans have trouble retaining information in their short and their long-term memory without the support of REM. So as babies learn throughout the day, which they learn more than anyone does, think about all of the experiences that they have and how new they are to them. It's important as they learn for them to experience REM so that their brain has time to process it all. Another important element of REM is brain development. So neural connections are incredibly important for a baby's development. And research suggests that REM sleep is when neural connections go into overdrive, meaning that REM promotes development. There's also believed to be a link between REM sleep and coping mechanisms. So another important reason for REM sleep is mood. So coping skills are particularly important to a baby for them to have healthy development. And this will help them in everything from communication development to executive functioning. And by executive functioning, we're talking about the ability to self-regulate and to use memory and other higher level functions. Sudden infant death syndrome also known as SIDS, is the sudden unexplained death of an infant who's younger than one year of age. It's the leading cause of death in children between one month and one year of age. Most SIDS deaths occur when babies are between one month and four months old. So the causes of SIDS isn't fully understood, but there are steps that parents can take to reduce the risk. One very important step that can be taken is for parents to place their baby on their back when they go to sleep, even for short naps. It's important for babies to get tummy time, but that's for when babies are awake and someone's watching. In addition, it's important for babies to sleep on a firm surface, like a crib mattress covered with a fitted sheet. It's also important that soft objects and loose bed bedding are kept away from the baby's sleep area. Breastfeeding seems to also reduce the risk of SIDS. Also, it's important to make sure that babies don't get too hot and parents should keep the room at a comfortable temperature. What would be comfortable for an adult? It's also important that parents make sure that uh, there is no one who smokes near the baby and that mothers are not smoking during pregnancy. In the 1990s, there was a campaign called Back to Sleep, and it still has continued. And in this campaign, nurses and doctors strongly encouraged parents 
to have their babies sleep on their backs. Years ago, people used to think that it was best to have babies sleep on their stomachs, that they would sleep better. And even if a baby might sleep better, it's tremendously safer for them to sleep on their backs. It's extremely important that parents do that. You can take a look at figure three six in your textbook and you can see how sudden infant death syndrome has declined over the years. And this is very attributable to the back to sleep campaign and the education that nurses and doctors have provided to parents. Newborns are well prepared to interact with their world because they're born with a rich set of reflexes. Reflexes are unlearned or involuntary responses that are triggered by a specific form of stimulation. Some reflexes help newborns get the nutrients that they need to grow. For example, the rooting reflex and the sucking reflex both ensure that the newborn can begin a new diet of life-sustaining milk. Other reflexes protect the newborn from danger in its environment. For example, the eye blink helps newborns avoid unpleasant stimulation. And other reflexes are the foundation for larger voluntary patterns of motor activity. For example, the stepping reflex is a precursor to walking. Reflexes also help reveal whether the newborn's nervous system is working properly. So for example, infants with damage to the sciatic nerve don't show the withdrawal reflex. In the same vein, uh, many reflexes normally vanish during infancy. If they linger, this suggests a problem in the developing nervous system. During infancy, babies progress from reflexes to voluntary movement. We have what's called the cephalocaudal pattern, and this is exemplified by a gain in head control before the ability to walk. We also have the proximal distal pattern, and this is exemplified by an infant grasping with their whole hand first and then their fingers later. With each of these, we see an average age as well as a range of typical ages. So for example, the average age of sitting is seven months with a range of anywhere typically between five and nine months of age. A major accomplishment of infancy is the skilled use of the hands. Newborns have little apparent control of their hands, but as they approach one year of age, they're extraordinarily talented. At about four months of age, infants successfully reach for objects. And these early reaches can look kind of clumsy because they don't move their arm and hand smoothly to the object. Instead, their hand moves a short distance. It then slows down and moves again in a slightly different direction. And then this is repeated until the hand finally contacts the object. As infants grow, their reaches have fewer movements but they're still not as continuous and smooth as reaches by older children and adults. Grasping is a type of fine motor skill and it poses a different challenge from reaching. Now, when, when infants are beginning to grasp, they have to coordinate movements of individual fingers to grab an object. So it becomes more efficient during infancy as they are practicing this and as their brain is developing. Most four-month-olds use their fingers to hold objects, but not until seven or eight months do we begin to see them positioning their hands to make it easier to grasp an object. If trying to grasp a long, thin rod, for example, they might place their fingers perpendicular to the rod, which is the best position for grasping, and then they reach more slowly for smaller objects that require more precise grip. So at four months of age, we see what's called the palmer grasp. And this is the use of fingers and the palm, but not the thumb to grasp objects. By around nine months, we see the pincher grasp. And this is the use of the thumb and the forefinger to grasp an object. In infancy, we see the use of gross motor skills. And this involves the use of large muscle groups that control our head, torso, arms, and legs. These are larger movements, and they're generally developed before fine motor skills. Some examples of gross motor skills include the baby eventually being able to lift their head up when on its stomach. 
the baby being able to move their head from side to side when lying on their back. And eventually the baby sitting with little support at the waist. At birth, an infant's vision isn't very well developed. They can only focus about eight to 16 inches from their face, and they only see black, white, and gray. As early as the first week, babies begin to respond to movement, and they begin to focus on faces. Soon after that, the baby will begin to smile as a parent or caregiver comes close. And this is an important sign that the baby sees and recognizes the caregiver. Over the next 10 to 12 weeks after birth, the parent will begin to notice the baby's following moving objects and recognizing things, especially toys and mobiles that have bold or geometric patterns. As their color vision begins to develop, babies see red first, and then they will see the full spectrum of colors by the time they reach five months of age. So when do babies begin to see clearly? Well, Depth perception and eye-hand coordination begin to develop when infants reach approximately five months or six months, so around that point in time. From about four to six months, that's when babies begin to reach out and try to touch objects, and this is something that previously tended to only happen by chance. So you all have probably heard of the term 2020 vision. And this is typically thought of as normal visual acuity. By six months of age, a child's visual acuity is around 2100. So a child won't reach adult levels of visual acuity until they reach about age four or five. As you've read, there are multiple benefits to breastfeeding. Interestingly, there was a study that was published in January 2007 in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. And the article authors suggested that babies who were breastfed had significantly better vision as young children than babies who were fed formula. So um, because the scientists had previously thought that there was a chemical known as DHA that was found in higher concentrations in breast milk than in formula, and this enhances the vision of developing children, what they did is they randomly added DHA to the formulas of some of the non-breastfed children. So as you might have heard, DHA, it's an omega-3 fatty acid, and um, some of you may know that it's added to many brands of infant formula, and these are marketed as being closer to breast milk. Some studies have suggested that children who consume formulas that are fortified with DHA have higher cognitive function than children who drink unfortified formula. Um, but these studies haven't compared DHA fortified formulas to breast milk itself. So going back to vision, what was very interesting was that breastfed children were significantly more likely to score higher on tests of depth perception than formula fed babies, and that there was no significant difference in depth perception between those who were fed formula and those who had received the DHA supplement and those who had not. I think it's important to keep in mind that many mothers want to breastfeed, and that's not always a possibility for mothers. And there are certainly many things that mothers can do to provide a very nutritious environment and nutrient-rich environment or opportunities for their baby. But this is an interesting study that does show the benefits of breastfeeding when it comes to vision. Hearing is almost fully developed at birth and it's present by the seventh month of prenatal development. Please be sure to read about the cat in the hat study described in your book. In infancy, the baby has the ability to recognize familiar voices and sounds and it can initially differentiate between many language sounds, but this ability disappears. The ability to experience touch and pain, just as you and I do, is fully developed at birth, and so too is smell and taste. As many of you may know, newborns do prefer sweet tastes, and they also recognize and prefer their mother's scent. Just like adults, infants prefer to pay attention to new and interesting things. If left in the same environment, over time, they become accustomed to their surroundings and they pay less attention to them. This process is called habituation. 
Habituation can be a very useful way to test cognitive and perceptual processes. Please be sure to read the section in your book where this is described. This is also habituation predictive of later cognitive ability. So the speed or the efficiency with which infants show habituation, it's shown to predict behaviors like language acquisition and verbal and nonverbal intelligence. So we've described a variety of sensations or sensory capabilities that infants have. Please be sure to be aware of the concepts and terminology within each of these sections that involve vision, hearing, and touch and pain, and taste and smell. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that babies be exclusively breastfed for the first six months and that breastfeeding continue for at least 12 months and thereafter for as long as it's mutually desired. Again, as I've mentioned before, this is a personal choice for the mother to make. Uh, and it is something that while many mothers want to do this, they may not be able to. Sometimes this can be due to returning early to work and not being able to be with their baby or having a baby in the NICU. Uh, stress sometimes can make it difficult. Sometimes other issues that can be related to difficulty in latching or painful latch. Uh, sometimes babies have what's called a tongue tie, and this can be treated and reduce pain that mothers may experience, but there are many reasons that a mother may not be breastfeeding that, have, that are unrelated to whether or not she actually wants to. And again, this is a personal choice for the mother to make, but it is important to be aware of all of the benefits that breast milk provides for babies, and it is the ideal way to feed a baby. It's truly no exaggeration to say that breast milk is nature's perfect food. Uh, breast milk is exquisitely tailored to meet the nutritional needs of a newborn baby, and there are multiple advantage of being breastfed. So, for example, uh, it is the best nourishment. Breast milk is designed for a new baby's brand new digestive system. The protein and fat in a mother's milk is easier for the baby to digest than cow's milk formula and its micronutrients are easily absorbed. Breast milk also offers protection against infections. Every time that a baby nurses, they get a healthy dose of the mother's antibodies, which help boost their immunity against colds, ear infections, respiratory tract infections, and other common childhood illnesses. Especially during the first six months, the mother's antibody-rich milk also helps protect their baby from diseases that they haven't yet been immunized for, like, for example, uh, influenza and whooping cough. Breastfeeding is also um, thought to reduce the risk of SIDS. So it, uh, at least if, it, if the baby's breastfed for two months, it's, uh, it cuts the risk of SIDS by nearly 50%. And they're not really sure why this is, but it may be that breastfed babies rouse from sleep more easily and it could be that they have added immune protections that might be playing a role. Breast milk is also easier on the baby's tummy and it, because it goes down easier, it stays down easier and newborns are much less likely to suffer, who are being breastfed are much less likely to suffer for, from constipation or diarrhea compared to babies who drink formula. Breastfeeding also promotes a healthier weight, and it really lets babies, their appetite, call the shots. A uh, breastfed baby is likely to stop feeling full. Um, they, let the, they let their mother know that they're no longer hungry, whereas a bottle-fed infant might be encouraged to continue until the bottle's empty. So what's interesting is that these, um, because they're able to better regulate what they're consuming in infancy, um, not only is this beneficial then, but these weight-related benefits may be persisting for years. And then there was a major study that was done over 16 countries, and they found that babies who were exclusively bre breastfed for six months, that there was a, for those babies, there was a reduction in the risk of childhood obesity by nearly 25%. It's also thought that breastfeeding is um, very helpful to the brain. And many studies show a slight but statistically significant increase in the IQ of breastfed babies and larger brain size compared with those who are formula fed 
in children who are as old as 15. So why might this be? Uh, we've talked about some of the nutrition that breast milk offers. And so breast milk contains key nutrients for brain development. Um, there are some um, like cholesterol and omega-3 fatty acid, DHA, hormones like oxytocin, um, thyroxin, estrogen, and nerve growth, um, and epidural growth factors. In addition, breastfed babies get lots of skin-to-skin -skin contact with mom. Now, so too can bottle-fed babies, but this in turn, in terms of the brain boost that breastfeeding may be giving, this may be adding to the, um, to ca causing the infant to feel nurtured and safe, which promotes intellectual development. But again, of course, bottle feeding parents can tap into this benefit too by keeping close to the baby during feeding and doing skin to skin feeds as well. What's really interesting too is that breastfed babies tend to have more adventurous taste buds. So, um, it seems to be that because the breast milk takes on the flavor of whatever the mother's eating, it acclimates a baby early on to a world full of flavors. So researchers have actually found that nurse babies are less likely to be timid in their taste than their formula fed peers once they move on to solids. And this may be, you know, this sort of translates into a toddler who might be more inclined to prefer bold or unusual tastes over those that are bland. Of course, there are many benefits of breastfeeding to moms as well. Uh, breastfeeding helps to promote postpartum recovery. It's also very convenient. Uh, it's also a built-in bonding, but of course, uh, this, uh, this is something that mothers who bottle feed their babies can provide as well, but just in a different way also can provide potentially some possible health protections down the road for mothers, possibly slashing the future odds of developing chronic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoporosis, and um, potentially high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and heart disease. And um, it, in addition, mothers who breastfeed do have a longer period of time where they don't have their period following the birth of their child. Typically, mothers who breastfeed begin to ovulate about four to six months after giving birth. And for some women, their periods don't come back for much longer. Of course, mothers who are breastfeeding should not rely on this as a form of birth control. Um, unless you're hoping to get pregnant, make sure that you talk to, if you are breastfeeding, if a mother is breastfeeding, uh, that mother needs to talk with their OBGYN about birth control options. There have been multiple instances where you will, and people you may know who were pregnant and then they um, gave birth and they breastfed and then um, they got pregnant before even having their first period after giving birth. So again, unless you're wanting to have a child, uh, you know, right away after or soon after having um the one that you may have just had, it's important to talk to your doctor about birth control and not rely on breastfeeding as a way to prevent pregnancy. So why the, while the US Department of Health and Human Services and other org, important organizations that um, support child development and play an important role in child health, uh, they recommend exclusively breastfeeding babies for the first six months and supplementing a diet with breast milk during the first two years. Many moms aren't able to do this. And like I mentioned, there are a variety of reasons that moms struggle with this. And a big reason is because there are many workplaces that are not supportive. And sometimes healthcare providers are not supportive. So we need to think about because we know the benefits of breastfeeding to both the mom and to the baby, we need to be advocates for moms. Ultimately, we're being advocates for family. We're being advocates for healthy development of the baby and the health of the mom. When we support mothers being able to um, provide for their baby in that way for as long as they would like to. So typically uh, in this country, Babies are introduced to solid foods at around four to six months of age, and this can vary, can be a little bit later for some babies, depending upon the parents. And typically this starts with semi-solid foods like 
um, rice or oatmeal cereal. And it's important to introduce one new food at a time. And this allows for the parent to check for allergies. So they try one food with that baby and they see how the baby responds and give that you know, a day or two, see how the baby's responding with that. And then within a couple of days, if there's, um, if there's an, some sort of allergic response, then the mother or father knows that it's due to that food. Whereas if the mother or father have been introducing several foods at a time and there was an allergic response, they wouldn't know which one of those foods was causing the allergy. So doing this one at a time is going to be very important. And finger foods are typically introduced by about 10 to 12 months of age. But when we're talking about introducing solid foods, it's, it's very important that parents work with their pediatrician and, they, and that they develop a plan with them. Many children around the world experience malnutrition. It occurs in undeveloped, underdeveloped, and developed countries. One type of malnutrition is marasmus. This is starvation due to a lack of calories and protein. Children who have marasmus lose fat and muscle until their bodies can't function. They also experience dehydration, chronic diarrhea, and stomach shrinkage. Children who live in rural areas where it's difficult to get food or in an area that has a food shortage are at an increased risk for developing marasmus. Kwashiorkor is the result of severe, severe malnutrition or a lack of protein. It's different from Erasmus, which again is that form of malnutrition that's due to a lack of calories. So proteins, as many of you know, are responsible for maintaining fluid balance in the body. Insufficient protein can cause the fluid to shift to areas of the body where it shouldn't be, and it accumulates in tissues. A fluid imbalance across the walls of capillaries, this can lead to fluid retention or edema. So the exact cause of this condition isn't clear, but many think it's associated with diets that are consisting primarily of maize, um, cassava, which we see in uh, various parts of the world, and rice. Also, it's thought that perhaps a lack of dietary antioxidants may also contribute to this. It usually occurs after a child stops breastfeeding and before they reach four years of age. And it may occur because the child's no longer getting the same nutrients and proteins from their diet. It's most common in areas where there's low food supplies and high rates of malnutrition. So it does tend to be most common in places like Southeast Asia, Central America, Congo, South Africa, and Uganda. But it's also, it can, it has happened here in the United States. However, it is rare. So it tends to occur in areas where there's a limited food supply or a lack of official guidance about nutrition. And it's more common in areas that experience low food security, maybe due to a natural disaster, drought, conflict, or uh, low economic activity. Sometimes um, children who have Kwashiorkor, they, um, they will appear as though they are a typical weight or maybe even plump. But this, is, this appearance is deceptive because the swelling is due to fluid and not the presence of fat or muscle. So symptoms of this include a loss of appetite. Sometimes there may be a change in the color of the hair, dehydration, pitting edema or swelling, a lack of muscle and fat tissues. The child may be very tired and irritable and there may be frequent skin infections or slow healing wounds. Overall, malnutrition is a significant problem worldwide. One in every 13 children in the world are experiencing malnutrition. Most of these children live in Asia and in Africa, but we know that there are children living here in the United States who suffer from malnutrition as well. It is caused primarily by severe food shortages, regional diets that might lack certain proteins and vitamins, and infectious diseases that inhibit appetite. The possible effects of malnutrition are numerous. So just a few are listed here. The most significant and devastating effect is death. In addition, children who experience malnutrition are at an increased risk of having lower IQ scores, of having behavioral and attention problems, 
And I wanna mention that early malnutrition has the worst effects. This is because we can think about brain development and how rapid brain development is happening in early life and how much brain development depends upon good nutrition. We're now going to take a look at cognitive development in infancy and toddlerhood. By the time we finish this section of your chapter, you should be able to compare the Piaget's, Piaget's concept of schema, assimilation, and accommodation. You should also be able to list and describe the six substages of sensory motor intelligence, describe the characteristics of infant memory. You should also be able to describe the components and developmental progression of language and identify and compare the theories of language. As you'll remember from reading your chapter, Piaget believed that children are naturally curious and they act like scientists by creating theories about how the world works. Children's theories, though, are often incomplete, but they help make the world seem more predictable. Piaget suggested that children understand the world with schemes. These are psychological structures that organize experiences or a framework for organizing information. They're mental categories of related events, objects, and knowledge. So during infancy, children will group objects that are based on the actions that they can perform on them. So for example, infants can create categories of objects that can be sucked and objects that can be grasped. And then after infancy, schemes are based on functional or conceptual relationships, not action. So for example, Preschoolers learn that forks, knives, and spoons form a functional category of things I used to eat. Or they learn that dogs, cats, and goldfish form a conceptual category of pets. And then older children and adolescents add schemes based on abstract concepts. And we'll be looking at this later on. But just as an example, an adolescent might put fascism, racism, and sexism in a category of ideologies I despise. As you'll also remember from your reading, schemes change constantly and they adjust to children's experiences. Assimilation happens when new experiences are readily incorporated into existing schemes or when they fit new information, again, as your text is stating, into that existing schema. So for example, um, in the imagine a baby who has the grasping scheme, the baby soon discovers that it works on blocks in a toy car. Um, they extend, they're extending the existing grasping scheme to new objects, and this is demonstrating assimilation. We then have accommodation, and this happens when schemes are modified, and this modification happens based on their experiences or new information that they get. So soon the infant learns that some, object, some objects um, can only be lifted with two hands or that some can't be lifted. So changing the scheme so that it works for new objects, like using two hands to grasp heavy objects, this illustrates accommodation. Because students sometimes will get confused between assimilation and accommodation, I have a scenario that I would like to read for you to help you to better understand these concepts. And this is an example of um, children as they experience assimilation and accommodation in action. So let me go ahead and read this to you. When Ethan, an energetic two and a half year old, first saw a monarch butterfly, his mother cat told him, butterfly, butterfly, that's a butterfly, Ethan. A few minutes later, a zebra, swallowtail butterfly, landed nearby and Ethan shouted, butterfly, mama, butterfly. A bit later, a moth flew out of the bush and Ethan cried, butterfly mama, more butterfly. As Kat told Ethan, no honey, that's a moth, not a butterfly. She marveled at how rapidly Ethan grasped new concepts with, with so little direction from her. How was this possible? So what happened here is that um, Piaget would, would suggest that Kat, his mom, named the monarch butterfly for Ethan and he formed a new scheme. So something like maybe butterflies are bugs with big wings. And the second butterfly differed in its color, but it was still a bug with big wings. So it was readily assimilated into Ethan's new scheme for butterflies. 
But when Ethan referred to the moth as a butterfly, as you'll remember, Kat corrected him. So Ethan was forced to accommodate to this, uh, this new experience. He changed his scheme for butterflies to make it more precise. Okay, so you'll remember accommodation is expanding the schema to incorporate new information. So as he did this, he may have said to himself, butterflies are big with thin bodies and, or I'm sorry, butterflies are bugs with thin bodies and big, with big colorful wings. So he also created a new schema, maybe something in his mind that went like, um, a moth is a bug with a bigger body and plain wings. So he was differentiating between the two. So accommodation, in, in this case, accommodation and assimilation were working together to help him make sense of those experiences. He, he was able to see that the moth and the butterfly were separate through that process of assimilation and accommodation. There's, there's another example in your textbook at figure 313 of assimilation and accommodation. And so you can see the same process that's similar to what Ethan in the last example I read you experienced. As you'll also recall from your reading, Piaget came up with a series of stages of cognitive development. Let's first take a look at the sensory motor stage. So this sensory motor stage or period is from birth to two years of age. And again, it's the first of Piaget's four stages. And in this stage, infant's thinking progresses along three major areas. And these three areas include, as you probably noted in your book, infants at this point are adapting to the environment and exploring the environment. So that's one major front. Another one is you see that they have a change in their understanding of objects. And then something else you probably noticed is that they begin to use symbols. So as you'll also remember reading, newborns respond reflexively to many stimuli, but between about a month and four months of age, reflexes are begin to be modified by their experiences. So for example, uh, an infant may kind of accidentally touch his lips with his thumb, and this might trigger sucking and pleasing sensations that it produces. And then later, that same infant might try to recre uh, recreate these sensations by guiding their thumb to their mouth. So sucking is no longer occurring in response to a nipple, that reflex that the child had. It's now something that has been modified by their own accidental experiences. The infants found a new way to initiate sucking independently. Piaget suggested that within the sensory motor stage, there are six substages of development. And the first one, the first substage, is in the first month of life. And this is the stage of reflex acts or reflexes. And this is when the newborn baby is responding to external stimuli with innate reflex actions. So for example, if you, if you brush a baby's mouth with your cheek um, or, or their cheek with your finger, um, it, it'll, suck the, it'll suck your finger reflexively. The second stage is, um, the second stage is primary circular reactions or the second substage. And this is where the baby uh, repeats pleasurable actions, just like I mentioned in that example a moment ago. So it repeats those pleasurable actions like putting its, finger, its thumb in its mouth that are centered on its own body. So another example is, you know, baby at, babies at this age, and this is a, this substage is from one to four months, they'll wiggle their fingers or kick their legs. And these are not reflex actions. They're done intentionally for the sake of the pleasurable stimulation that it produces. And then we have secondary circular reactions, and this is from four to eight months approximately. And now babies are repeating those pleasurable actions that involve objects and um, actions involving their own bodies. So an example of this would be an infant who shakes the rattle for pleasure or um, the, you know, the pleasure of just hearing the sound that it produces. The fourth stage of Piaget's sensory motor stage is the coordination of, sec of secondary circular reactions. And this is from approximately eight to 12 months. And this is where babies are combining actions to achieve goals. So instead of just 
you know, keeping these interesting events going that they've experienced before, now they are, they have an ability to use their own new knowledge to reach a goal. So for example, um, the infant won't just shake a rattle, but will reach out and knock to one side an object that stands in the way of getting a hold of the rattle. And so this starts to demonstrate, this is really demonstrating what we call object permanence. So object permanence is the understanding that objects exist independently. So PHA suggested that infants lack this understanding for much of their first year. And instead, he suggested that um, infants think, or you know, children at this age, think that objects exist only when they are in sight, only when those objects are in front of them. So as an example, if a, a toy that the baby likes is placed near them, and then it's covered with a cloth, the four to eight month old might lose interest in this object. And now the child who is in this stage, this where they can coordinate these secondary circular reactions and has mastered object permanence, they know that even though that bait, that toy is hidden, that it still exists. So they'll search for that object, even though it's been covered. We'll see that this object permanence continues to more fully develop. And it suggested, Piaget thought that um, this the object permanence isn't fully developed until the baby is about 18 months old. The next stage is the, is the stage of tertiary circular reactions. So these are different from secondary circular reactions. So we had earlier secondary circular reactions and now we have tertiary circular reactions. And these are different because they're intentional adaptations to specific situations. So here, the infant who um, once may have explored an object by taking it apart, not, now tries to put it back together. So for example, the baby might stack the bricks it took out of its wooden truck. Um, it might, you know, it stacks those bricks that it took out it put, by putting them back, or, you know, it might put the, um, you know, nesting cups that you all may have seen before. Uh, it may put those back together. So they're not just taking those apart, they're putting, back, putting them back together, one inside another. And then we have this, um, the beginning of representational thought. And this is from about 18 to 24 months. And this is where the child can use symbols to represent ideas. So this is a transitional period between the sensory motor stage and the next stage that you'll be learning about, which is the pre-operational stage. And this is where babies can now form a mental representation of objects. So they can visualize things that are not physically present. And this is crucial to the acquisition of what we talked about a moment ago of object permanence. And it's the most fundamental achievement of the whole sensory motor stage of development. Make sure you know each of these substages and make sure too that you know what object permanence is. If you look in your textbook at table 3-2, you'll see the infant substages that they go through in the sensory motor period. So while Piaget's theory has been important in contributing to our understanding of cognitive development in children, there are some criticisms. So for example, uh, one criticism is that uh, infants seem to understand concepts earlier than what Piaget suggested. One, for example, is object permanence. So as you'll remember, Piaget thought that infants or that children don't fully master object permanence until they're in that fifth substage of the sensory motor period. But some research has found that infants seem to show earlier knowledge of, um, of object permanence. This means that um, we as adults have a lot of difficulty remembering events that happen earlier than age three or four. The reason that this may be happening is it because when you are uh, four, three, two, uh, when you're those ages, do you not have the say? Do you not have the language skills? Well, we know we don't. But is it because of the lack of, lack of language skills? Is it because of a lack of understanding of the self? So there's not a 
real definitive answer to this question. Another concept that's related to memory is deferred imitation. And so what this means is that when a child watches an adult or anyone else do something and then they imitate that behavior after there has been a delay, that that's demonstrating evidence for memory. And this seems to be present by about six months of age. In addition, infant memory is context dependent. What that means is that they're much more likely to demonstrate uh, recall when they are in a situation where the, um, you know, a particular event happened that they are being, um, where their memory is being tested. So that's what uh, context dependent memory means. Even newborns hear remarkably well, and the left hemisphere of a newborn's brain is sensitive to language. More importantly, infants can distinguish basic speech sounds. So now that we've talked about phonemes, let's look at the uh, four other important components of language. The next one is a morpheme, and this is the smallest unit of meaning in language. So if you were, for example, to take all of the letters of a sentence or all of the words of a sentence and put them together so that they're all connected so that as you look at that sentence, you can't differentiate between, you wouldn't have spaces between those words. They would just all be a string of letters. Uh, recognizing the smallest unit of meaning in that sentence would be, um, uh, comparable to what a morpheme is. So a morpheme is that smallest unit of meaning in a language. Semantics are the rules that we use for determining meaning. And then syntax are the rules for constructing sentences. And pragmatics are the rules for communicating. And of course, contextual information helps us to determine meaning. For example, for example if we had a sentence with the word no in it, we would know if we're talking about N-O or K-N-O-W by looking at the other words in the sentence. In other words, by looking at the context of, um, of that word within the sentence. Newborns and young babies make many sounds, as most of you know. They cry, they burp, they sneeze, but language-based sounds don't appear immediately. At about two months, infants begin to produce vowel-like sounds like ooh or ah, and this is a phenomenon that's known as cooing. Sometimes infants become really excited as they coo. Uh, this may be reflecting the joy, for example, of playing with sounds. After cooing comes babbling, and this, these are speech-like sounds that have no meaning. Uh, a typical six-month-old might say da or ba. Um, that, you know, these sounds that sound like a syllable consisting of a consonant and a vowel. Over the next few months, babbling becomes more elaborate as babies experiment with more complex speech sounds. And older infants sometimes repeat a sound, as in ba, 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 and begin to combine different sounds like da, ma, ba. So babbling is not just mindless play. It's a precursor for real speech. For example, at roughly about 8 to 11 months, Infants babbling sounds more like real speech because infants stress some syllables and vary the pitch of their speech. To make the transition from babbling to real speech, infants need to learn that particular sounds form words that can refer to objects, actions, or properties. In other words, they must recognize that words are symbols. Soon after their first birthday, children's experiences lead them to form concepts like round bouncy things or furry things that bark. With the insight that speech sounds can denote these concepts, infants begin to identify a word that goes with each concept. So by around 12 months, we tend to see an infant expressing their first word. By about 18 months, we see a significant naming explosion. And then by around two years, this is where we see children beginning to put words together. And of course, this is an average time. There's always going to be a range. As children are learning language, their receptive language is always greater than their ability to communicate with words. Receptive language is what we understand. Think about yourself. If you've ever learned a foreign language, you know that your ability to understand that foreign language, to understand what others are saying, is typically greater, especially in the beginning, 
than it is for that then is your ability to express what you want to say a common mistake seen in children as they're learning learning speech and language is what's called underextension, and this is where they define a word too narrowly so for example uh, using car to refer only to the family car and ball to refer to a favorite toy ball are examples of underextension. Between about one and three, children sometimes make the opposite error, which is overextension. And this is where they define a word too broadly. Uh, this is where children might use the word car to refer to buses and trucks or doggy to refer to four-legged animals. Whether you think it's cute or you don't really like the way it sounds, Baby talk is a compelling scientific phenomenon. All around the world, people use a special register when they speak to the very young. This infant-directed speech is recognizable for its higher pitch and more melodic, emotionally charged tone. These features capture a baby's attention and make it easier for the baby to grasp the emotional intentions of speech. In fact, Fascinating experiments show that adults listening to a foreign language are better able to pick up on a speaker's emotions when he uses infant-directed speech. So how do children learn language? There are a variety of perspectives, and we'll focus on some of these. So one approach we can think about suggests that we learn language through reinforcement, which is suggested, for example, by Skinner, and then also through imitation. So Skinner and other learning theorists suggested that all aspects of language, like sounds, words, grammar, and communication, are learned through imitation and reinforcement. But critics have been quick to note that most of children's sentences are novel, which is difficult to explain in terms of the simple imitation of adult speech. For example, when children imitate adult sentences, they don't imitate adult grammar. In trying to repeat, let's say, I am drawing a picture, Young children may say, I draw a picture. And some linguists, which we'll be looking at, argued that grammatical rules are too complex for toddlers and preschoolers to infer uh, them solely on the basis of speech that they hear. Another criticism of this approach is that language development seems to look similar across cultures. So there needs to be, there, there needs to be an, an additional explanation for speech for us to fully understand its development. Many scientists believe that children are born with mechanisms that simplify the task of learning grammar. So according to this view, children are born with brain circuits for inferring the grammar of their native language. Grammar is not built into the child's nervous system, but processes that guide the learning of grammar are. So for example, here's some evidence that can support this view. If children um, are born with a grammar learning processor, then specific regions of the brain should be involved in learning grammar. And as it turns out, the left hemisphere of the brain plays a critical role in understanding language. At about two, specific regions of the left hemisphere are activated when sentences break simple grammatical rules, like a noun appearing when a verb should be expected. Here's another one. If learning grammar depends on specialized neural mechanisms that are unique to humans, then efforts to teach grammar to non-humans should fail. In fact, uh, when researchers teach grammar to chimpanzees, chimps master just a handful of grammatical rules governing two-word speech, but only with massive effort. That's, uh, you know, it's unlike the preschool's child learning of grammar. Something you'll learn about later on in the text is that there's a period from a birth to about 12 years of age that's a critical period for acquiring language uh, generally and, that mas and mastering grammar particularly. If children don't acquire language in this period, they never truly master language later. So all of these sorts of ways, all these ways of thinking are consistent with the idea that children have an innate grammar learning mechanism. They don't prove the existence of, of these mechanisms, but they do suggest that. Now Chomsky's theory of universal grammar says that we're all born with an innate understanding of the way that language works. He based his theory on the idea that all languages contain similar structures and rules, a universal grammar. And the fact that children everywhere acquire language the same way and without much effort seems to indicate that we're born wired with these um, basics already present in our brains. Not everyone agrees with Chomsky's theory, but it continues to have a significant effect on 
how people think about language acquisition today. So as mentioned just a moment ago, there is a critical period for language development. Something else for us to think about is the concept of social pragmatics. This refers to the way in which children use language within social situations. So this is the ability to use language for different purposes, like, for example, to greet or inform people about things, to demand, command, or request. It also includes the ability to adapt language to meet the needs of the listener or the situation, like talking differently to a baby versus an adult, or talking louder when there's lots of noise. And then it also, it also includes following those often unspoken rules of conversation and storytelling, like taking turns in conversation, looking at the speaker, standing at an appropriate distance from the speaker, um, using facial expressions and gestures. Language development has been correlated with specific changes in brain development. Two important areas you should know about are Broca's area, which is located in the left frontal lobe near the motor cortex and is important for motor aspects of language production, and Wernicke's area, which is located in the left temporal lobe near the auditory cortex and is responsible for understanding and creating meaning. If you take a look at figure 321 in your textbook, you'll see a drawing of the brain showing Broca's and Wernicke's area. Again, you'll notice that Broca's area is located in the part of the brain that's also important for higher level processing. And you'll also notice that Wernicke's area is located in the part of the brain that's important for the processing of auditory information. Now, we're going to be taking a look at the psychosocial development in infancy and toddlerhood. By the time you finish this section, you should be able to identify styles of temperament and explore goodness of fit. You should also be able to describe the early theories of attachment, contrast styles of attachment according to the strange situation technique, explain the factors that influence attachment, describe self-awareness, stranger wariness, and separation anxiety, and use Erickson's theory to characterize psychosocial development during infancy. Some babies are quiet most of the time, but others will often cry. Some infants respond warmly to strangers, and others may seem shy. These characteristics of infants indicate a consistent style or pattern of infant behavior, and collectively, they define an infant's temperament. Temperament can be described as innate characteristics of the infant that include mood, activity level, and emotional reactivity. The dimensions or characteristics of temperament emerge in infancy, and they're related to dimensions of personality that are found in adolescence and adulthood. It's moderately stable throughout infancy, childhood, and adolescence. So for example, newborns who cry under moderate stress tend, at five months of age, to cry when they're placed in stressful situations. Temperament reflects both heredity and experience. For example, Identical twins are more alike than fraternal twins in most aspects of temperament. The environment also contributes to temperament. Infants are less emotional when parents are responsive. Conversely, infants become increasingly fearful when their mothers are depressed. And some temperamental characteristics are more common in certain cultures than others. Chess and Thomas have identified three temperament styles. These include easy, difficult, and slow to warm up. Easy infants are easily soothed. They're adaptable and they're in a generally positive mood. Difficult infants react negatively to new situations. They cry frequently and they're in more of a generally negative mood. And then slow to warm up children uh, have a low activity level. They tend to adjust slowly to new situations and they may often be in a negative mood. Temperament may influence social interactions, and how well an infant and parent interaction style matches is called goodness of fit. Social interactions between parents and their children are bi-directional, and the way that a parent responds to a child's temperament affects then how the child responds and how their personality develops. Personality can be defined as a pattern of behavior, thoughts, and emotions that differ from person to person. The behavioral characteristics of a person in different situations are referred to as personality traits. 
there are many theories of personality development that attempt to explain why we are the people that we are. We can think about people like Freud, and he emphasized the role of the unconscious. We can think about behaviorists like Skinner and Pavlov, who would emphasize the role of learning. We can think about humanistic psychologists like Maslow and Rogers, who suggested that personality development is based on free will and focused on important concepts like self-concept. And there are many other approaches or theories of personality development. The behavioral characteristics of a person in different situations are referred to as personality traits. So what is the difference between personality and temperament? If your temperament is your canvas, which is primarily inborn, your personality is what you paint on that canvas. Multiple factors, including socialization, irritability, education, peer pressure, and then, of course, the different um, approaches to personality. Think of other variables like, again, the unconscious, the role of learning, the role of self-concept, play a, an important role in shaping the personality of the person. But when it comes to temperament, the major part in developing it is played by your biology. Babies seem to experience broad positive and broad negative emotional states. But these, difference, these seem to differentiate rapidly, and by about six months of age, babies are able to experience all basic emotions. So what do I mean by basic emotions? These are emotions that are experienced by people worldwide, and they each consist of three elements, a subjective feeling, a physiological change, and an overt behavior meaning that you can physically see it if you are in the environment with that baby. So the onset of happiness, for example, it's evident in a baby's smiles. In the first month, infants smile while asleep or when being touched softly. The meaning of these smiles isn't exactly clear. They may just represent reflexive responding to bodily states. But there's an important change that takes place at around two to three months of age. At this stage, we see social smiles. And this is when infants smile when they see another human face. Sometimes social smiling might be accompanied by cooing, that early form of vocalization that we've talked about. Smiling and cooing seem to be the infant's way of expressing pleasure at seeing another person. Sadness is also observed at about this age. Infants might look sad, for example, when their mothers stop playing with them. Anger is one of the first negative emotions to emerge. Infants become angry, for example, when a favorite food or toy is taken away. And then older infants become angry when their attempts to achieve a goal are frustrated. So, for example, if a parent you know, restrains an infant from trying to pick up a toy, typically the result is going to be the infant being very upset. Like anger, fear emerges uh, in this year as well. And at about six months, actually, we'll be looking at this here in just a few minutes, infants tend to become wary in the presence of an unfamiliar face. And this is known as stranger wariness. So by about eight months, fear, sadness, and anger are differentiated. And like I said, anger is exhibited in, typically in response to being prevented from doing something. And sadness happens in response to the absence of a caregiver. And then again, fear tends to happen in response to the absence of a caregiver because of what we call um, separation anxiety, which we'll be looking at, or the presence of a stranger, which is, like I mentioned a moment ago, <clears throat> stranger wariness. So again, the basic emotions that we seem to be wired with, no matter where you go in the world, you'll see these emotions expressed. And we each have this ability to interpret or to, you know, to accurately interpret these emotions when we're, um, even when we're young, no matter where in the world we go, these are happiness, anger, fear, surprise, sadness, and disgust. And these appear early in infancy. So at about one to two years of age, we start to see self-conscious emotions. And these include envy, pride, shame, guilt, doubt, and embarrassment. These do require self-awareness and social understanding. Infants use others' emotions to direct their behavior. 
in unfamiliar or ambiguous environments, they often look at their mother or their father as if they're searching for cues to help them interpret the situation. This is known as social referencing. So for example, if a parent looks afraid when they're shown a novel object, a baby who observes them doing this, a 12 month old, let's say, is less likely to play with the toy than if they were to watch their parent look at a novel object and the parent did not look, did not look afraid or perhaps looked happy. In that instance, the 12 month old would be more likely to play with the toy. So social referencing shows that infants are very skilled in using their emotion, the emotions of adults to help them to direct their own behavior. Adults often regulate emotions. For example, we routinely try to su uh, suppress fear because we know there's no need to be afraid, for example, of the dark. Uh, we also routinely try to suppress anger because we don't want to let a friend know how upset we are. We might suppress joy because we don't want to seem like we're gloating over good fortune. Well, infants too can regulate their emotions. When something frightens or confuses four to six months olds, for example, uh, a stranger or a mother who suddenly stops responding, they often look away or move close to a parent. By about two years of age, a distressed toddler's face will typically express sadness instead of fear or anger. And it seems that perhaps by this age, they've learned that a sad facial expression is the best way to get a mother's attention or support. So as children develop, they regulate their own emotions and rely less on others. Initially, this self-regulation requires some assistance from others, but as the brain develops, the control improves with experience as well. According to Bowlby, children who form an attachment to an adult, that is an enduring socio-emotional relationship, a close bond that's associated with security, are more likely to survive. The person is often the mother or father, but it doesn't need to be. The key is a strong emotional relationship with a responsive, caring person. This attachment is, it really forms the basis for future relationships, and it affects the confidence and curiosity that toddlers have or don't have as they're in new environments. It also influences a toddler's sense of self-concept. Reintroduced to the group, they weren't sure of how to interact, Many stayed separate from the group and some even died after refusing to eat. Even without complete isolation, the infant monkeys raised without mothers developed social deficits. They sh would show reclusive tendencies and cling to their cloth diapers. Harlow was interested in the infant's attachment to the cloth diapers and speculated that the soft material might stimulate the, or simulate the comfort that was provided by a mother's touch. So based on this observation, he designed the now famous surrogate mother experiment. In this study, Harlow took infant monkeys from their biological mothers and gave them two inanimate surrogate mothers, one who was a simple construction of wire and wood, and the second who was covered in foam rubber, rubber and a terry cloth. So the infants were assigned to one of two conditions. In the first, we have the wire mother who had a milk bottle and the cloth mother did not. And in the second, the cloth mother had the food while the, while the wire mother had none. In both of these conditions, Harlow found that the infant monkeys spent significantly more time with the terry cloth mother than they did with the wire mother. When only the wire mother had food, the babies came to the wire mother to feed and they immediately returned to cling to the cloth surrogate. Harlow's work in this area showed that infants also turned to inanimate surrogate mothers for comfort when they were faced with new and scary situations. When placed in a new environment with a surrogate mother, infant monkeys would explore the area, run back to the surrogate mother when startled, and then venture out to explore again. Without a surrogate mother, the infants were paralyzed with fear. They would huddle in a ball, sucking their thumbs. If an alarming noise making toy was placed in the cage, the infant with a surrogate mother present would explore and attack the toy. Without a surrogate mother, the infant would just cower in fear. So these studies produced groundbreaking empirical evidence for the significant importance of parent-child attachment 
and uh, the importance of maternal touch in infant development. So even though this study was conducted over 70 years ago, his discoveries, Harlow's, continue to inform the scientific understanding of the, of the fundamental building blocks of human behavior. Bowlby was interested in the negative effects of maternal deprivation. And more specifically, he was interested in what, what are the effects of a child who, or a child having no person present who would serve as an important attachment figure. And so again, that attachment figure doesn't need to be a mother. It just, it needs to be someone who is significant and connected to the child. And he suggested that caregivers needed to be responsive and that the caregiver and child need to engage in mutually enjoyable interactions. He also suggested that um, the, the parental presence or caregiver presence that gives the child a sense of safety, that this was called a secure base and that this affected the tendency or the reduced tendency, if it wasn't present, for children to feel um, comfortable and confident in exploring their environment. Bowlby also thought that attachment was important for survival and that infant behaviors like crying promoted attachment. He also noted that there were negative consequences when there was an absence of this significant caregiver, that it seemed to increase one's risk for depression, uh, perhaps even aggression, and, um, and other negative behaviors that we might see in development. Another important theorist that we need to think about is Eric Erickson. And if you'll remember, Erickson suggested that we have eight stages of what he called psychosocial development. The first stage that Erickson said that we as humans go through is what he called trust versus mistrust. And he suggested that the most important goal of infancy is, develop a, is developing a basic sense of trust in our caregivers. So for this trust to develop, Caregivers need to be responsive to an infant's needs. Uh, they also need to be consistent in this responsiveness. So again, it's in this initial stage of development that children learn whether or not they can trust their world. And it's the care that they receive from their parents and other adults that's critical in forming this trust. So because an infant is entirely dependent on their caregivers, the quality of the care that the child gets from, from their parents or other caregivers plays an important role in shaping that child's personality. So it's during this stage, again, that they're learning whether or not they can trust people around them. Some of the things that can affect this might include, for example, when a baby cries, does the caregiver attend to their needs? When the baby's frightened, will someone comfort them? When the baby's hungry, do they receive nourishment from their caregivers? So trust occurs when uh, you know, children develop this sense that they can believe in their caregivers. They begin to trust that the world is safe and they know that needs will be met. Mistrust happens when they have distrusting caregivers and they have a sense of fear about the world and they're unsure if their needs will be met. If a child successfully develops trust, they'll feel safe and secure in the world. Caregivers who are inconsistent, emotionally unavailable, or reject the child contribute to feelings of mistrust in the child that they care for. A failure to develop trust can result in fear and a belief that the world's inconsistent and unpredictable. Erickson thought that these early patterns of trust or mistrust help to control or at least exert a powerful influence over that individual's interactions later on with others for the remainder of their life. So children who learn to trust caregivers in infancy will be more likely to form trusting relationships with others throughout the course of their lives. This is not to suggest that children who don't experience trust can't overcome this. There are multiple opportunities throughout our lives, throughout our lives to overcome this, but we certainly need to have those opportunities so that we can continue to develop in the optimal way. Attachment can take different forms, and these were shown by a procedure that's known as the strange situation. The strange situation involves a series of episodes that are about three minutes long. The mother and infant will enter an unfamiliar room filled with interesting toys. The mother leaves briefly, and then the mother and baby are reunited. 
Meanwhile, the experimenter records the baby's response to separation and reunion. Based on how the infant reacts to separation from and reunion with the mother, researchers have discovered four primary types of attachment relationships. One is secure, and the three others are types of insecure attachment. So let's first look at secure attachment. So the baby may or may not cry when the mother leaves, but when she returns, the baby wants to be with her. And if the baby's crying, it stops. Babies in this group seem to be saying, I missed you terribly. I'm delighted to see you, but now that um, all is well, I'll get back to what I was doing. And about 60 to 65% of American babies have secure attachment. Let's look at ambivalent, and it's sometimes called resistant attachment. So here, the baby is upset when the mother leaves, but remains upset or even angry when she returns, and they're difficult to console. So these babies seem to be telling the mother, why do you do this? I need you desperately, yet you leave me with no warning. I get so angry. About 10 to 15% of American babies have a resistant or ambivalent attachment relationship, which is a type of insecure attachment. While we're looking at these attachment styles, I want you to keep in mind that if you have a child or if you work in a child care center or if you have a family member with a child and you've been in a situation where the mother or father has left and then they've returned um, and then you notice certain behaviors that are demonstrated in the baby, I want you to keep in mind that what you're noticing in the baby we cannot identify as, or we cannot use as a way to determine the type of attachment style that the child has with their caregiver. The reason we can't is that in order to determine this relationship, we have to have a very specific environment that's set up and it needs to be under these types of laboratory conditions. So please don't use this as a way to determine the type of relationship that a, uh, a child has with their caregiver. So what parental behaviors tend to contribute to these different types of attachment styles? So parents who um, help to foster a secure attachment, they meet a child's needs and they're doing so in a responsive and appropriate and consistent way. Children who have an insecure ambivalent attachment, their caregiver, their caregiver has responded inconsistently to that child's needs. And children who have an insecure avoidant attachment relationship with their caregiver, that caregiver doesn't respond to child's needs. And then we have insecure, disorganized, or disoriented attachment. And in this case, the caregiver has behaved erratically or may have abused the child. Let's take a look at some of the consequences of attachment. So as that first social relationship, infant-parent attachment lays the foundation for infants' later social relationships. Infants who experience the trust and compassion of a secure attachment, they tend to develop into preschool children who interact confidently and successfully with their peers. So for example, uh, some research suggests that they tend to have higher quality friendships than children with insecure attachment relationships. Also, secure attachment in infancy is associated with more stable and higher quality romantic relationships later in life. And then I think this is important to uh, point out as well that research consistently seems to link disorganized attachment and behavior problems that involve anxiety, anger, and aggressive behavior. So Keep in mind, though, that attachment is only the first of many steps along the long road of social development. Infants that have insecure attachment are not doomed, but this initial, uh, this initial experience can interfere with their social development. Some of the things that can happen specifically that your book describes are non-organic failure to thrive. This is where infants don't grow, develop, or gain weight on schedule. Another is reactive attachment disorder. And this is where children have disturbed or inappropriate attachment behaviors. Some children, though, in spite of insecure attachment, are resilient, and they seem to uh, be able to overcome the challenges and successfully adapt. I think overall it's important for us to remember that 
uh, when we look at child behavior, we don't only want to understand that behavior through the lens of attachment. So for example, let's imagine that we um, come across a preschool child who doesn't have great relationships with peers in their classroom. While this can be explained by issues with attachment with an important caregiver, that may, that's only one potential explanation. So there are multiple reasons for that to happen. Uh, you know, the other one that I just mentioned a moment ago is again, you know, remember research points to it's linking disorganized attachment um, to problems involving anxiety, anger, and aggressive behavior. That may be that may be the reason that a child shows anxiety, anger, and aggressive behavior, but there are lots of other reasons that children may show those behaviors. So attachment is one important lens that we should look through. We should also note here that this really shows us how important that, per, that caregiver infant relationship is and how important it is that caregivers are consistently responsive to that child's needs so that they're developing a sense of trust of their world. And we can see how this connects back to what Erickson had to say about the development of trust. The very last concept that we'll be looking at is the second stage of psychosocial development that was proposed by Eric Erickson. If you'll remember, Erickson said again that we go through those eight stages of psychosocial development. And this is the second stage, and it is the, it is the stage that toddlers go through as they're developing a sense of independence. So between one and three years of age, children understand that they can control their actions. And with this understanding, they strive for autonomy or for independence from others. But autonomy is counteracted by children's doubt that they can handle demanding situations and by the shame that may result from failure. So a blend of autonomy, shame and doubt gives rise to will. The knowledge that within limits, they can uh, act on their world intentionally. It's important that parents are very thoughtful about how they react to children as they strive for independence, as negative reactions and restrictions can prevent independence. And this can uh, have a negative effect on self-esteem and initiative later. As always, please let me know if you have any questions and please be sure to be reading your textbook and responding to the uh, learning guides for each chapter.